science fiction, or as it's known in the streets, sci-fi. What exactly is it? How did it get to the current state it's in? And what are the larger discussions currently happening about the genre? These are all ideas I plan on exploring here in this video. And to get to the first one out of the way, I actually wanna jump over to Google's definition because I actually found it to be a fairly reasonable definition of sci-fi. So according to Google, sci-fi is fiction based on imagined scientific or technological advances or major social or environmental changes. So that's a fairly broad definition, but I find it to be an appropriate one for the rather large ideas covered within sci-fi. And it actually reflects the really incredible history of this genre quite well, because unlike a lot of literary genres, Sci-fi's view from the public and the actual works within it have remained fairly consistent, except for one big topic we'll get into later. But let's go ahead and jump into its history, shall we? Now, a lot of people think that sci-fi emerged in the 20th century. You know, right before World War I, we started getting the first scientific ideas. And while in some ways they're kind of right, they're also very, very wrong. To find the actual origins of sci-fi, we need to go back. We need to go way, way back. No, I'm not one of these people who points at Ovid and said this is the origin of all things sci-fi just because there's slight elements that could be interpreted that way. That's insane. No, I go even further back. If we go to ancient India, yes, 4th and 5th century BC, there are epic poems that have elements within them that are unquestionably sci-fi elements. In one Hindu epic called the, I'm gonna say this wrong, Raman Ramanyanan Ram I ah uh, dyslexia This poetic epic included flying devices that took mankind not only into the sky but space and into the water That is some sci-fi elements if I've ever seen them I'm not claiming this is a hardcore sci-fi story, but it is a clear sign that man has had the origins of this great genre percolating in the back of our skulls since quite literally ancient times. I mean, think about this. This is an ancient civilization that didn't even have, you know, cars, and they're already like, hey, what if we could shoot a vehicle into space? That's so cool to think about. But this conversation could be had pretty much indefinitely. And you could even make a very strong case that there's probably an ancient text from 1000 BC that's been long forgotten and burned up in history that would also be classified as sci-fi because some merchant thought of a calculator. I don't know. So we're gonna go ahead and jump forward a good amount of time. I just wanted to point out how truly tied the wondrous mentality of sci-fi seems to be with the human psyche. We want to have a grand vision of the future. We want to predict great things. And yes, some sci-fi goes really dark, but I just enjoy the idea that since our earliest times, we've wondered about the future. But if you wanna talk about, okay, where can we find the first clear definitive this was written to be a sci-fi story, it's still earlier than you might think. We could go all the way back to the 16th century and find certain material that has prototypes for many of the tropes we see in modern sci-fi. Hell, William Shakespeare in 1610, this boy put out the Tempest. And in the Tempest, we have a mad scientist. That's a obvious sign of the sci-fi genre to come. So all you Rick and Morty fans out there, you better give mad respect to your boy William Shakes. He helped develop it. Of course, again, I'm saying this is not the modern state, but in terms of the roots sci-fi grew from, we got them right here. Okay, 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 I'm gonna stop being around the bush. Daniel, what is the first sci-fi story? Very popularly, a lot of people will point to Frankenstein. We have a mad scientist who assembles a flesh being from a lot of deceased individuals and resurrects it back to life, creating, which many people online have stated is, maybe the first form of AI in literature and they're not entirely wrong. Other people will make case for the first instance of AI to be like the Hebrew Gollum. I'm not sure if I would classify that, but I'm also not gonna say you're wrong. But Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is a absolutely brilliant example of gothic horror blending with sci-fi, something that is a fairly popular subgenre of sci-fi itself, and is held up to the test of time magnificently. Our neck-bolted boy here is an icon for a reason. He is beautiful, Mwah. And Frankenstein's monster does not seem to be leaving pop culture anytime soon. He's been a staple since his release, and we are still getting Frankenstein movies every few years. Also, if you haven't read Frankenstein, you're a bad person. It's pronounced Frankenstein. Now, the year is 1926. 
Sci-fi is what you think it is, largely due to two incredible authors, H.G. Wells and Jules Verne. Their works, like 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and War of the Worlds, have solidified science fiction. But we're not in the golden age yet. We're in this odd spot where, of course, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea is well known and War of the Worlds is War of the Freaking Worlds, but we're not in the golden age. The likes of Asimov are still in the distance, so why are we sitting here? Why are we in 1926 discussing science fiction? What's, what's that I hear on the horizon? What's coming down the road? It's pulp, baby! Woo! Amazing. Stories comes into existence, and with it, the wave of pulp sci-fi comes a ring a ding ding and down the road. Many science fiction authors found their way to success through magazines like this. Well, Amazing. stories specifically said, hey, we want science-based short stories from people. They also published some of the fantastical, and you know, fantasy also is in tech. No, no, it's not time to talk about fantasy. That's bad. No, get out of here. No, no. Okay, sorry, science fiction. But while many people were aware of stories like War of the Worlds and 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, they didn't really think of sci-fi as a genre, and it was magazines like Amazing Stories, or its competition Astounding Stories, real original there, or Weird Tales that helped make the mass population aware of sci-fi as a genre. It's one of those things where it's like, the books came first, people read and liked them, and then they became aware of the genre that encompasses them after the fact. We also had an issue of fantasy during this time being lumped in with sci-fi, but once they broke apart and distinguished themselves within literature, sci-fi entered its golden age and we reached a zenith. Now, before we jump into golden age though, there's one more thing with these magazines I must point out. I know I was just at like a 10 and now I'm at like a four, but trust me, it's appropriate. I need reverence here, because these magazines also had the first space operas printed within them. Whether it's Skylark of Space, Crashing Sun, the influence of the media monolith Star Wars had its roots here. So yes, things like weird tales resulted in, you know, this. So as we get closer to the golden age here, it's very much so also worth note that history had an impact on the direction of science fiction. As we get past World War II especially, inventions like the nuclear bomb, jet engines, rockets, had very strong effects on the stories that were then penned by the Golden Age authors. Really, it's unavoidable to see these comparisons. The civil rights movement in particular had a fairly massive impact in the development of sci-fi as a whole. Yes, there's the rather popular examples of like the first interracial kiss being broadcast on Star Trek, but during the civil rights movement and in the decades after, we saw several notable black authors using the lens of sci-fi to tell stories that were examinations of our own society's racial injustice, economic injustice, sexism. And there were, of course, examples of this before the civil rights movement. W.E.B. Du Bois' short story, The Comet, is a prime example of that. But authors like Octavia Butler, who use sci-fi in their writing to have a very strong message about these topics, ended up bleeding out into sci-fi as a whole. And now it's very common to see sci-fi worlds that are built express these more progressive ideas. Of course, there are still black authors to this day who are utilizing the platform of science fiction to tell similar stories with themes like these. N.K. Jimson's 2015 release, The Broken Earth, is a prime example of that. Sci-fi itself is essentially just a tool to be used, and these authors used it in the fashion that helped them re-examine the future and the past. But now, in a triumphant pose, we slide into what is the Golden Age. Here, authors like Heinlein, Asimov, Clark, not you, Elrond, Get out, you're disqualified, you culty weirdo. But these wonderful gents and many others start pinning the iconic works that have now become synonymous with the brand of science fiction as a whole. Whether it's iRobot, Childhood's End, Stranger in a Strange Land, The Foundation, oh Jesus, Starship Troopers, these guys made science fiction what it is today, not only by constantly evolving the genre, but just taking it to literary highs it hadn't reached before consistently. Respect to H.G. Wells and Jules Verne, I like you, and especially Mary Shelley, you were so far ahead of your time, but man, the Golden Age authors, 
I love you. And this was an era where science fiction became as hard as it had ever been. These guys didn't spend much time working on things like character. It was about scientific ideas and the ramifications of those ideas. Bradbury, Bradbury kind of broke that a little bit. He has works that are much more character focused than a lot of the others. And some of the more hardcore guys did. This is not absolutist. For example, Stranger in a Strange Land is a very character focused sci-fi story. But in general, this was the day and age where you have your ultra dry, totally devoted to science, sci-fi reach its zenith. We're there, baby. It's, mm, it's sci-fi. But who is this on the horizon? Who's coming galloping in here, disrupting the flow and bringing in an alternative genre mix to the sci-fi formula. Well, hold on to your britches because a lot of people tried to do this, but none did it with the level of wave as Frank Herbert and Dune. Woo! Dune made sci-fi different. Dune had so much influence on where sci-fi went and how it eventually split with his truly epic sci-fi story Dune. So what exactly is that split we're talking about though? And well, I do consider Frank Herbert's Dune to be a lot more hard in the spectrum of sci-fi than a lot of the stuff we get today. It definitely helped push the needle into sci-fi splitting into the two camps you'll see the fan bases in now. The hardcore sci-fi versus the softer sci-fi. But before we get into that discussion, I want to talk about other media besides written and how they have helped elevate sci-fi as well. First and foremost, there have, of course, been sci-fi movies for a long, 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 long time. All the way back to 1902's A Trip to the Moon, that was sci-fi. Granted, movies just kind of followed the trend of sci-fi for a long time, moving on to things like Metropolis, eventually 2001 Space Odyssey, and now definitely more the trend of softer and harder sci-fi in this contentious balance of which one gets more box office results. Spoiler warning, soft sci-fi tends to do better with mass audiences. I will say though, cinema reached its truest peak with 2001 A Space Odyssey and has never surpassed it. This is the height of visual sci-fi and maybe just sci-fi as a whole. Brilliant, unbelievable masterpiece of a movie that I don't think anyone can deny. If you're one of these people who doesn't like 2001 Space Odyssey, that's, that's fine, man. You can have your opinion. That's cool. That's fine. That's fine. Oh my God. Television shows actually helped kind of stay closer to the cutting edge of sci-fi, not only because many of the greatest sci-fi writers of the time continually were writing for shows like Twilight Zone and Star Trek, but also they have a faster turnaround, so they can just kind of interpret a lot of those stories and ideas quicker than movies at the time. And now that I've mentioned Twilight Zone, I just have to also say, I love you Twilight Zone so much. If you haven't watched Twilight Zone, find a way to do it and do it. It's again, one of the greatest pieces of television ever broadcast. You could also do a very fun thing where you kind of alternate watching Twilight Zone and Black Mirror back to back and then eventually you'll hit the bad season of Black Mirror and you'll go, wow, that went downhill. How could you screw it up so bad, Netflix? My God. Who thought taking a hardcore sci-fi show and putting a Miley Cyrus episode that's just like her telling her life story in an exaggerating way would be a good thing? <clears throat> I even like Miley Cyrus and I just didn't like that episode. Come on. You know, you're thinking, oh, we covered movies and TV. That's all that's worth mentioning when it comes to media and its relationship with sci-fi. You're wrong, you ignorant slut. Video games have been an absolute blessing to science fiction in recent years. Whether these video games are telling their own space opera, seem to be about to tell an awesome softer sci-fi story, or actually being a rather hard sci-fi game, gaming has actually helped push forward credibility for sci-fi as a whole. While the Academy still refuses to often give Oscars to sci-fi performances or sci-fi best pictures, sci-fi video games have become one of the most respected genres of gaming. And I actually take my hat off to the gamer crowd as a thank you for letting video games often tell incredible sci-fi stories across the spectrum, whether it's softer or harder. Okay, I know I've said soft and hard sci-fi a lot. Let's go ahead and talk about the Great Divide. As with most things on the internet, this division within sci-fi fans is not nearly as bad as a lot of people will try to make it out to be. But there is one camp in the harder sci-fi group who looks at softer sci-fi and goes, ugh, you're betraying your roots. You're not exploring sci-fi ideas anymore. And then there's people over in the soft sci-fi corner who are going, yeah, we're not we're not trying to do that, we're just having fun. We have laser swords and Marty McFly trying to bang his mom, so we're having a good time over here. And what I would like to say to people who need to remove their rod from their butts so they can enjoy both sides of things is, 
Remove the rod from your butt and enjoy media for media. So what's basically happened here is in the 70s and 80s, while there's been soft sci-fi for a long time, hence how I mentioned Stranger in a Strange Land, soft sci-fi became a lot more popular very quickly. There were many contributing factors to this, whether it's Flash Gordon or, you know. Yeah, soft sci-fi kind of took off and has become far more profitable, at least when it comes to movies and TV shows, than your harder sci-fi Generally. Over here you have your Flash Gordons, your Back to the Futures, and your Star Wars. While over here you have your 2001 Space Odysseys, your Annihilations, and your Arrivals. There can definitely be successes on both sides, and trust me, the world is big enough for both. I just want to put out this flame war once and for all. Be logical and just have fun. Plus, these guys over here have way more laser swords, and I don't want to be restricted to the people without laser swords. I want the laser swords. Also, Back to the Future trilogy is like one of my favorite movie trilogies of all time. I like the third one even. Fight me about it. The biggest change here, especially when it comes to literature that is harder sci-fi, it's just that this genre shifts the exploration of those scientific ideas that are different and being presented to the reader to the forefront of the narrative. Whereas softer sci-fi often takes character or the general plot that's unrelated to this sci-fi stuff and will push it to the front as well. An interesting example of this actually can come from one author, Andy Weir. He's written two sci-fi books that fall on different sides of this spectrum. The Martian kind of sits at like a 7 out of 10 to hard sci-fi, which 10 being the absolute hardest, and Artemis falls at like a 4 out of 10, much more towards the softer angle. So if you want a very clear-cut example of this, you could just read these two works back to back. Now as for the future of science fiction, I'm not entirely sure. I have been made aware that there are certain countries outside the US that are having a stronger science fiction presence in recent years. Unfortunately, I'm not super well read in those, though I am curious to see what will happen. I very much so enjoyed the three-body problem from China and am excited to see what is going to come from over the shores to help influence and change the direction of the current science fiction trajectory, because every time we start seeing other fantasy become popular within the West, usually Western authors will begin to adapt and improve what what they're currently working on can add some real spice to the mixture but that's all i really had to say that's the video bye